from Triple E Media. I'm Ramat Mohammed, and this is The Backstory. It's actually criminal for any woman to die from pregnancy. Uh, because pregnancy is a physiological process like eating like sleeping like so it's going to be very strange for you to say it will, somebody died from eating so it's a physiological process someone died from, from urinating someone died from defecating so it, it should be as strange as that that is what how strange maternal mortality should be but then it's pretty common amongst us here Every year in Nigeria, about 36,000 women die due to pregnancy-related complications. That's about 100 women per day or four women every hour. In our last episode, we talked about the most common ways that a woman could die during pregnancy, childbirth, and even after childbirth. These include ectopic pregnancy, pregnancy-induced high blood pressure, gestational diabetes, blood clots, breech birth, uncontrolled bleeding, and infection. Many of these scenarios, they can be prevented or managed through early monitoring, early diagnosis, and early treatment by trained professionals. We have what we call delays in um, seeking healthcare. That's Dr. Adewumi Babatunde. I'm a medical doctor um, with about five years of experience. Um, and Dr. Babatunde is a resident at the Federal Medical Center at Bilkuta and he also has a master's in public health. And we have three delays. The first delay is actually the delay in deciding to go to the healthcare center. So I'm pregnant and I want to go to the healthcare center. So why? Why should I go to the healthcare center? My, my culture does not believe in that. My culture believes in home birth. My culture believes in traditional birth. Um, my culture believes in so many other things, not the hospital. So that delay comes from your culture can affect you. So I'm not going to the hospital. But the second delay is like the delay in actually getting to the healthcare center. So moving from my house to the healthcare center, is there a transportation system? How do I move? Um, is my place a riverine area where I have to get a boat to get down to the hospital? Um, are there cars? Is, is my major um, trans mode of transportation trekking? And when you now get to the hospital, there's also another delay, the delay in actually accessing the healthcare itself. Now, all three of the delays that he just mentioned, they play an important role in women being able to access care during and after pregnancy. But that first important one, in moving from your house to decide that well, I want to get healthcare, your culture has a lot of role to actually play in that. So culture is very, very, very important. It's, it's not one of those factors. I think for me, it is the factor. In this episode, we're going to focus on culture and how it plays a role in delaying a woman's decision to get health care before, during, and after her pregnancy. Most of the times, women actually want to go to the hospital. We have more women coming to the hospital than men. Women do not want to die. Women are the ones who own their body and who carry the children. They know how they feel. But oftentimes, the decision to seek healthcare is not hers to make. Because the truth is, most of these um, decisions are either taken by their mother-in-law, their husband, somebody who is in a position of authority over them. And the people who make the decision on her behalf are operating under a set of beliefs and rituals that we call culture. So um, when you talk about culture, culture is um, the person. There's no way you can separate someone's culture from the person. Um, I'm a Yoruba boy. <laughs> you can't separate my yoruba from me. Uh, even though I grew up in the North and I've stayed in the Southeast, but still my culture still predominates in the things that I do. It still um, um, affects my decision taking in so many things that I do. So um, like we were taught in social studies, culture is a way of life. Culture is something that we learn based on our environment. It's not something that you just wake up one day and you have it. It's multifaceted. Um, it's not something that um, you just acquire. It's something that you see uh, while growing up. It's something that has been rung into your ears 
happen. You see, you see your mother talk about this. You see your father talk about this. You see people around you talk about this. And then it begins to build. It builds into an attitude. You have a behavior towards it. So it, it shapes your health-seeking behavior. In fact, you'll see that in even highly educated people, when it comes to their health care, when it comes to pregnancy, it's their cultural beliefs that take over. Okay, let me give an example. Last week, I had a friend of mine who had been pregnant, um, was pregnant rather, and this was a very precious baby because it was like two to three years of infertility. And when she got to the hospital, her pelvimetry was done and she was asked to that she couldn't give birth to the child herself, so she needed to do a CS. My friend is actually a very spiritual person and she sent me the results because I've been like her personal doctor following up on her case um, for a very um, long time. And she sent me the results and I said, friend, you would, you'll be having a CS. And she started crying. And she's pretty educated. She said crying, and I told her, I said, do you know that there are women who opt for CS, who decide that they are going to do CS? But because of the culture around, a lot of people feel a woman who delivers via CS is not strong enough to give birth. Um, the Christians kind of have this um, Hebrew woman um, caveat. Oh, the Hebrew women gave birth to themselves. They never gave birth assisted. So a lot of people see themselves as Hebrew women. And in my head, I'm like, you're not, an, you're not a Hebrew woman, you're a Yoruba woman, you're a Hausa woman, you're an Igbo woman. And as cultures go in Nigeria, there are certain beliefs and rituals that put women at risk of maternal death. Okay, so the first thing is the age at which our women get pregnant. Will, do, will I even say women? <laughs> okay. Um, the age at which some females get pregnant. So you see children of 14, 15, 16 years getting pregnant. Females in the northern parts of Nigeria, they start to give birth somewhere between the ages of 14 and 20. While those in the southwest and the southeast, they start a little bit later, around 20 to 22. In the south-south, they're somewhere in between, where young women start to give birth between 16 and 20 years old. And... This is ingrained in some culture. A lot of people feel that a, a, a girl child is not entitled to education. Um, so she's only good to be married and she's only good to, um, to, to give birth to children. So she begins to give birth at a very young age. The Child's Right Act, it was introduced into Nigeria in 2003. And the act defines a child as any person younger than the age of 18. The act also prohibits marriage to a child. Now, as of 2020, all the states in the South have adopted the act into their laws, but only eight out of the 19 northern states have done the same. The 11 states in the North that have not yet adopted the Child's Right Act are Jigawa, Kano, Katsina, Kebi, Sokoto, Zamfara, Adamawa, Bochi, Borno, Gombe, and Yobe. And if we look at the states that have the highest mortality rates, they also happen to be the states that have not adopted the Child's Right Act. When, when you have a child between the ages of, I'll still call them children, between the ages of 14 and 16 giving birth, um, their um, pelvis is not prepared for that process. For a woman to be ready to give birth, um, her body needs to be acquainted to that process, be ready to get to that process. But when you are still a child and you're asked to give birth, you, your body is not ready for that process at all. So this leads to um, a very high level of maternal mortality. And, you know, they don't offer them CS. They allow them to give birth um, with the traditional birth attendance. They push, 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 eventually probably push the child out and then rip off their pelvis and then begin to bleed. They don't take them to the hospital in time and then they die. Uh, and that is like one of the most obvious causes of maternal mortality in our country here, um, because a lot of people have not subscribed to the fact that you need to allow a girl child to mature, a girl child to also have a life of her own, a girl child to decide, and that, and that is where- Now, the second most common cultural belief and ritual that increases maternal mortality is the number of children a woman is expected to have. So um, we believe in this part of the world that 
um, children are gifts from God, and then um, women should continue to give birth to the number of children they can give birth to. On average, a woman in Nigeria gives birth to, say, about five children. In most southern states, the average is between three to four, with a few states like Ebonyi, Edo, and Kwara reaching five. In the northern states, the average is between five to seven children per woman. A woman give birth, gives birth to more than four children, her body begins to weaken. She begins to, um, she begins to get to that level in which we call ground multiparity. My friends who work in the north, northern part of Nigeria tell me that they see women who are gravid at eight, para seven, gravid. one even told me that he saw a woman who was gravid at 11, para 10. So that gravida 11 means that she has been pregnant 11 times. Para 10 means she has given birth 10 times. And this kind of woman, the womb has a carrying capacity. So the moment you exceed the carrying capacity of this womb, the womb becomes to uh, begins to weaken. And this can lead to um it can lead to postpartum hemorrhage because the womb busts, which we call uterine rupture, and then there's blood everywhere, they don't take her to the hospital in time, and she dies. In Nigeria, it's not just about the belief that children are gifts from God. Women are celebrated for having a certain number of children or a particular gender. It's common to find Nigerian cultures where a cow is killed to honor the birth of the 10th or 12th child. So this external validation that women get encourages them to keep giving birth, sometimes at the risk of their own lives. Now, apart from the young maternal age and the number of births that put our women at risk, there's also this issue of cultural beliefs about nutrition. So when a woman is pregnant, they tell her not to take snail because her child is going to be um, salivating. That's very common among the Yorubas. Uh, they will tell her, don't take snail. If you take snail, your child will, saliv your, your child will be um, salivating hugely when you give birth to the child. They'll tell them not to take bon vita because if you take bon vita, your child will be too big and you will go for CS. Um, they'll tell them, um, don't eat this, don't eat that, don't eat too much. If you eat too much, you can have postpartum hemorrhage. So they tell them that because your baby is in your tummy, so if you eat too much, you can have postpartum hemorrhage. Um, they tell them not to eat um, a lot of things because it's going to affect their babies. And most of these things they tell them not to eat are the nutrition, nutritional things. They are the very, very... Um, important things that would help um, them build their blood. So when you notice, no, most of our women who come to the hospital, they have very, very, very low, um, what's it called, PCVs, that is blood levels. And that is as a result of the fact that they are not eating properly. So um, nutritional supplements are out there that they give to women, but then that is not as uh, effective as... Um, the food that you are going to eat, the normal, the good food, it's cheaper than even the nutritional supplements because you are going to have a lot of nutrients from it. Your baby is going to have a lot of nutrients from it. Then there is the belief that all weight gain during pregnancy is good. Another thing that people say is, um, oh, when a woman has edema, that's swollen feet during pregnancy, they say, oh, it's because you're having a male child. Oh, because your baby is big. And edema is actually a sign of so many things that are not too right in pregnancy. Um, a very, very important example is um, eclampsia, um, pre-eclampsia, hypertension in pregnancy. So the moment a woman has a swollen feet, people will tell her that, oh, it's because you have a male child, that is why your leg is swollen. Um, something that people say often that, I wonder how did you get your diagnosis of male child from having um, a swollen feet. And as we heard from Dr. Cecilia Benga in the last episode, swollen hands, feet, and face may be symptoms of something much more serious that could lead to maternal death. Um, a lot of people will tell the women, don't go out in the sun, um, because when you go out in the sun, evil spirits will come and enter into your baby. The sun is important for vitamin D, and vitamin D is important for bones, teeth, and muscles. If you don't expose a woman to um, some amount of sunlight, it's going to affect um, uh, vitamin D in her, which could also affect the baby because everything the baby gets, she 
um, the baby gets from the mother. So if the mother does not have some things, the baby doesn't get some of those things. So a lot of people also believe that prolonged labor is as a result of when a woman is having prolonged labor, is as a result of infidelity or violation of a tradition. So a lot of people still believe that today, that when a woman has a prolonged labor, it's because she has cheated on her husband, it's because there are some traditional practices that she has flaunted and all that. In the Igbo land, there's one they call um, Ewu Uku. I don't know if I pronounced it well. Um, that a woman who has her 10th child, they have to do a ritual for her. And if you don't do this ritual um, for her, she's going, to, um, she's going to have prolonged labor, obstructed labor in her 11th child. Why on earth would a woman even have 10 children in the first place? Uh, because this is very, very dangerous to health. It's very, very dangerous to their health. But... Um, that is what we see um, in our environment. What Dr. Adeomi described are just a few of the cultural beliefs and practices surrounding pregnancy and childbirth. And these beliefs and rituals, they cut across all tribes and religions in our country. And the truth is, we are more common or we are more similar rather than um, how different we are um, in, in this country. Because you find out that most of these things, they cut across culture. You can't particularly point to one culture that they are the only ones that do this. You go to some parts of the Yoruba land, you find young women getting married. You go to the northern part of Nigeria, you find um, nutritional restrictions. You go to the southern part of Nigeria, you see people having 10 children. You go to the northern part of Nigeria, you see the same thing. So it's just like a cross-cultural thing between everybody. And it's not... Um, how I put it now, it's not something that you can see. There are some peculiarities to some culture, but then it also cuts across cultures. It's important for us to recognize that just like pregnant women don't want to die, these cultural beliefs and rituals were not meant to kill them. Before the advent of orthodox medicine, um, there are so many um, herbalists, traditional birth attendants that have been taking care of people. So medicine actually developed from most of these things and it became modernized uh, to ensure that, okay, things are done safely. All these um, um, beliefs came from the experimental stage of medicine in our own environment. And the truth is, it is not all our um, um, traditional beliefs that are actually bad. Many of these cultural beliefs started as protective practices. These things came from the fact of necessity. Okay, so how are we going to be able to ensure that our women give birth? How are we going to keep our women safe during pregnancy? How are we going to predict oh, the evolution of pregnancy? So most of these things came from actually that angle. The, the, the cultural beliefs were not meant to actually harm the women. The cultural beliefs were put there because that was what was believed to have worked at that particular time. But with the evolution of medicine and the ability to do things in a better way, we found them to be harmful to women. And the thing about beliefs and rituals is that we can't explain them in any sort of scientific way, but we do them anyway. Even the most educated of us have some beliefs and rituals that we still maintain. But the truth is, it has been passed down from generation to generation. And there are so many people who are adamant. You would find out that, like I said the other time, there are so many educated people that still believe in these things strictly. Okay, let me give you an example of my own personal self. So we have this belief in the Yoruba land that when you are going somewhere and you hit your left leg on a stone, or you, you hit your left, left leg on a stone, that means it signifies bad luck. But if you hit your right leg, it signifies good luck. Sometimes, Subconsciously, when I hit my leg on, on a stone, oh, it's left leg. I hope I'm not going to meet something bad there. So these things come from our subconscious. If you have grown up in a cultural society before, you discover that some of these things still stay with you. So it is still the same for um, these um, cultural practices in pregnancy. They still focus on those things that had they had known while they were growing up, things that their grandmothers have told them, things that their mothers have told them, things they've had from their aunties and from friends. So these cultural beliefs are actually gathered from a lot of interactions 
which comes from right from your childhood till you grow up so it's it's a lot and debunking these things and helping people to get to know the truth is pretty difficult because you can't just take away something that has been put in someone for 20 something years in one day with one interaction and when we live in a community where virtually everyone believes the same thing and carries out the same set of rituals it's hard to be the odd man or woman if your community believes that giving birth should be done at home without medication because that's how it's always done then who are you to do anything different? Now, it is true that cultural beliefs run deep, but so does money. And as much as we want to believe that cultural beliefs drive the healthcare-seeking behavior of pregnant women, it actually might not be that deep. I have an example of a woman who was in the in labor, um, and she called on... Okay, we told her, oh, madam, you can't give birth to this child. From what we have seen, you need to do a CS. And... The husband was like, he doesn't have money. Thank God the woman was, I think she had money. So she said, please help me call my husband. Because the husband was telling us, no, go ahead. Don't do a CS. Let her try to deliver it myself. So she told us to call her husband in. So in the heat of the labor, she looked into the eyes of her husband and said, you don't have money. Me, I have money. Go to the house, check under my pillow. There's also amount of money there. Bring it. Let them do this years for me. Doctors, please take me to the theater. So if she didn't have that amount of money under her, her pillow in her house, it means that she wouldn't have that CS. And the possibility of them leaving that hospital and going to a traditional birth attendance is high. And that would probably lead to her death. But because she had money with her that she could use to prosecute the procedure, that, that helped. So it's very, very, very important. Now, just to be clear, the hospital would have done the C-section even if the woman did not have money, but they would have required consent from either her or her husband. And since he didn't have the money, he was not going to consent and he was willing to risk her life. But in this case, the woman, she had her own money, and so she was in a position to make the choice that she needed to make to save herself and her baby. Dr. Adewumi shared another example with us that again illustrates the point. If a woman has access to money, that is enough to overcome some of these cultural beliefs about seeking health care during pregnancy. When I was working in the rural community, and in the community I found, I found out that um, people were no longer coming to the hospital for antenatal. And the reason behind this was because they felt it was more expensive than the traditional birth attendants. But the funny thing is, <laughs> the traditional birth attendants actually are more expensive than the hospitals. But because they collect their money in bits and pieces, you can't understand, you can't feel it. And traditional birth attendants will not even only collect money from you. They'll collect yam, they'll collect cassava, they'll collect um, palm oil, they'll collect rice, they'll collect fish. And on the day of your naming ceremony, you still carry food and go and give to them. When Dr. Adewumi discovered that people were not going to the hospital for antenatal care because of the perception of high cost, he decided to partner with an organization that could provide the community with free prenatal and postnatal multivitamins. So I partnered with another organization that gives women free multivitamins for their pregnancy and delivery. So I did, in that community, I did... Um, like an awareness campaign. I went to the king, spoke to him, and he gave us the opportunity to be able to reach out to people and talk to them about um, maternal mortality. And then I told them, if you come to the hospital, the, all the drugs, the multivitamin that you are going to take from the beginning of your pregnancy till the end, and even three months post your pregnancy, we are going to give to you. So women, who heard about these things and oh they're going to give us free multivitamin came to the hospital and the multivitamin actually had a very good packaging so it was even the women who were telling other women to come so our antenatal care um clinic began to improve when i stopped getting the supply and i left the place i still kept on getting calls that ah doctor women are asking for this multivitamin and all that so at the end of the day, financial strength, even more than culture and religion, might actually be the reason that drives a pregnant woman's healthcare seeking behavior. 
but there will always be pockets of resistance to modern methods of healthcare. One of the things that we often hear when we start having this conversation is, okay, you're bringing all of this or you will uh, thing to us here. We've been having children for a very long time, even before, you know, you, you hear a lot of these comments, right? Um, what, mm -hmm. what is your typical response to, to this type of thing? Okay. Uh, my response to them usually is, um, <laughs> I tell them that things are changing and there are better ways of doing things. And um, there's, there were so many things that we could not explain before the Oyibos came, but we can explain them now. Yes, you were giving birth and things were going normally, but then could you explain why the people who died, died then? There were so many things that you couldn't do now. What about that woman who died with a baby in her tummy? Were you able to bring that child out before the woman died? So what did you do in the case of um, women who had twins in those days? And then you tell them to go, uh, what's it called? To take them to, to, to the evil forest. Those were also traditional practices. Were, were they good? So um, most of these things, I just try to educate most of these women. But before I do that, the very, very important thing I usually do is to agree with them that yes, these things are good, but then they are good, we have better ways of doing them. Even if they are good, if there is a better way of doing something, are we not going to follow it? In the olden days, we trekked from, um, try to look for a distance now, we trekked from Niger State to Kwara State. We shot trekked and we got to where we we're going, right? But was that a good method of transportation? Right now, you can fly. You can go through cars. So why say Oyibos are bad? Before you, before you could communicate in those days, you needed to send a letter. A letter will get to um, where it's going maybe in months. But now you can pick up your phone and do a video call with somebody. Is it bad? So I try to make them understand that these advancements are not only in medicine, but also in their day-to-day -day life. They watch TVs now. Do they watch TVs in those days? So even if those things look strange to us, it is not everything that is strange that is bad. I try to explain to them, give them examples, take my time to make them understand the fact that, yes, you have been doing it a certain way, but there is a better way. So let us explore the better way and get a good results. Getting people to change behavior is hard. So even if you give the health education, they go home, they still cannot... Um, process it because how would they believe you who is a stranger who is a doctor who is doing his job to somebody who is their mother their auntie who they feel care more about them than you so it's it's a very difficult and complex mix yet behavior can be changed if we give the right incentives hi everyone i have one footnote before i get to the closing comment nigeria has improved maternal mortality over the past 10 years in 2015, the World Health Organization estimated that we had over 58,000 maternal deaths that year. Recent reports indicate that we are now at around 36,000 deaths per year. We thank and we congratulate all the men and women who have been working hard to make that improvement happen. But that number, 36,000, is still too high. That's about 100 women per day and four pregnant women dying every hour. We need to keep pushing that number down. A special thank you to Angela Umoru for production support and Dr. Babatunde Adeomi for your contribution to the discussion. Let's say that you live in a village and the government has finally decided that they're going to build that road, that road that you've been asking for. Now, the kids, they've been using that road to play, but now that it's a properly tarred road, they shouldn't be playing in it. But they don't know any better. They're kids, so they keep playing on the road. But now that the road is tarred, cars are going to be driving faster. And so there are going to be more accidents on the road. Kids keep getting hit. So the community decides that they're going to put up signs on the road warning drivers to slow down, they run campaigns on the radio to tell people to slow down. 
that doesn't really help. So one day, the local engineer, she decides to put tires down in strategic places along the road. And these tires force the drivers to slow down long enough for the kids to move out of the way. The point I'm trying to make with that story is that if you want to change behavior, if you want to change culture, you have to change the environment. Talking about changing doesn't make change. If you want people to do something a certain way, then remove the barriers to doing that thing. And right now, the biggest barrier, the biggest speed bump on the road to seeking maternal health care is cost. There is nothing more powerful than a human being who can make choices, nothing more inspiring than a woman who makes choices. But in the world that we live in at this moment, having money empowers choice because having money means you have access to more options. So when it comes to maternal health, what we have to do is figure out how to create a world where money doesn't dictate her ability to choose. And we can do that by either one, redistributing the money so that she has access to it when she needs it, or lowering the cost of her healthcare options. In Nigeria, option one, redistributing the money is as simple as enabling her to work and to save and manage her own money so that when she needs it, she has access to it. Or if we insist that she should not work, then let's set up universal basic income for every female from the age of puberty until death. Option two, lower the cost of health care. Dr. Adewumi gave us the example of a community that started to visit the clinic when the antenatal vitamins were made available to them free of charge. I'm going to bet that those vitamins were imported. But we can reduce the cost of those vitamins by manufacturing and packaging them here. The biggest barrier to seeking health care around the world is cost. Yes, sometimes culture plays a role, but when we're faced with a choice between life and death, most of us will damn culture and try our chances at whatever we can afford in order to save our lives or the lives of those we love. So let's stop using culture as an excuse to not do the right thing. Lower the cost of maternal health care. The Backstory is brought to you by Triple E Media Productions. Production copyright 2021 Triple E Media Productions. If you enjoyed this episode of The Backstory and want to hear more, subscribe to our 234 Audio YouTube channel. Episodes of this podcast and our other podcasts can also be found on our website, 234audio.com, as well as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. This episode of The Backstory was produced by Antonieta Kalunta, John Iwodi, Dominic Tabakaji, and Sam Tabakaji. Executive Producer, Ramat Mohammed. Special thanks to Mala Iwa Bagdo Ikaleku. If you are interested in sponsoring this program, reach out to us at 0818-230-1234 or email us at info at 234audio.com. Ramat Muhammad. See you next week.